Greetings, everyone. Uh, welcome to day 48 of 75 Days of Partition. Uh, this is Gunita here from the 1947 Partition Archive, and I'm absolutely delighted today to welcome Hazel Kahan. Uh, she has an absolutely fascinating story of partition and a personal connection that's quite rare. Um, she was, uh, well, I'm going to save that for the rest of the show, but let me give you a little bit of her background and her bio. So Hazel, Kaur, uh, Hazel Kahan was born in Lahore. And after a childhood in Pakistan, boarding schools that included being in Kashmir, in India, in England, after years in Australia and Israel, she finally came to the United States. Her PhD in psychology led her to a career in market research, which she followed with what now seems a rather baffling dedication and intensity. <laughs> After decades in corporate corridors and cubicles, hundreds of focus groups and thousands of frequent flyer miles, she now interviews people not for clients, but for her program on an independent radio station and writes blogs instead of reports. So welcome to the show, Hazel Kahan. I have, of course, heard your story offline, and I am so excited to share it with the world today. Um, so let me start by asking you, you have a really fascinating family connection uh, between India and Germany. Your parents uh, were from Germany. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your family history in Germany and how and when your parents came over to India? You, my parents actually, uh, uh, my father really wasn't German. He was Polish. I mean, no, well, my father was born in Poland. And then as a young child, he went to Germany, but he actually never had German nationality. So he, he was called German, but he really wasn't. He didn't, they didn't speak German at home. They spoke Yiddish because my parents were both Jewish and I'm Jewish. So they were born in 1909 and 1910, respectively, my father and my mother. And they didn't, they met, um, well, my father came from a very religious, very orthodox Jewish family, and they lived in what was called a shtetl, what is still called a shtetl. It's a sort of a Jewish enclave. And they were, as I say, religious, but also poor. My grand, my mother came from a very different background. She was a real bourgeois family in Germany, and, um, and she grew up there. My father actually came to Germany as a small child but as I say, they were never considered German. So they then had led very separate lives, except that they both wanted to study medicine. So separately, they, in different various universities, and then they, Hitler, in, this was, it. so in 1933, when they were in their twen early 20s, Hitler decided that Jews were no longer allowed to study medicine. So they both already, in, they didn't know each other. They both invested some time, obviously, in, in four years or whatever of, of their lives studying medicine. Uh, and the only two countries they could have become, they could have taken over their credits were either Italy or Denmark. So they chose separately, they met then in Rome and they were both studied, students in Rome where they met and then they got married. So 1935, they got married. In 1937, Hitler and Mussolini were starting to forge an alliance and um, it became difficult again for Jews. So my parents were told by some Roman Catholic priest from the Vatican, they, they were gonna go to Palestine originally, like all the, um, the rest of the family had gone from Germany to Palestine, which then, of course, became Israel. Um, well, some might say I wouldn't necessarily agree with that. But anyway, so um, so they went to he, he, this, this priest said to them, you know, you're young, you're European, you should go to India. They're looking for German doctors in India. So that's what they did. My father actually finished his his medicine his studies before my mother she still had six months to go so he got on a, a boat from italy to palestine saw his parents and his brothers and then went from ceylon as it was then he went for several months looking for somewhere to live where he could make a living as a, as a doctor 
And basically, wherever he went, he would try and find the German, or the, 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 the it was British Raj then. He would try and find centers of medicine and say, I, I need a job. Would you like me to be your doc doctor here? And they all said, no, 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 please go away. We don't need you here. Um, because they didn't want the competition. There were already quite a lot of European and German doctors around who had fled Hitler and gone there. So in the end, one thing led to another, and he ended up in Lahore. And then he wrote to my mother and said, Lahore is a perfect place for us, come. So she came, she, she, by then she finished her degree, she picked up, she packed up all their apartment and everything, and then came, and he went down to Bombay to meet her boat, and then they both went up to Lahore. And the this war is had started, year. that was 1937. Okay. So, so then, then after that, in 1939, I was born, and then my brother was born in 1940. And during that time, they were starting to build up a medical practice. They were young doctors, as I say, they were in their late, in mid, 27, 28 years old, and they wanted to, to practice medicine. And then that came to an end in on December 5th, 1940, which is a day that's important in our family because that was my father's 31st birthday. Sorry, 31st birthday. On that day, he was in the shower and my mother called him and said, the police are out here. They want to talk to you. And they said, when he went out, they said, you are under arrest because you are an alien, an, in, uh, an enemy alien which actually he really wasn't because the, it was only that Germany and Britain were at war. At that stage, he had a Polish passport. They were not considered aliens yet. But we were then given four days and sent to, um, four days to pack up their medical practice and their house and two very young children. And we, we went by train to um, I, I don't know whether it is via Pune, Pune, as it's called now. Pune, right. Pune, Pune. So um, we went, to, we were taken to Puranda, Purandar, fort, which is a fort. And there was a camp, an internment camp that run by the British. It's actually run by the Indians under British rule. The British, it was a police court. It was run by the police, not by the military. So and fascinating. I mean, I don't think anybody's really heard about this in Indian history, for sure. It's very little. I mean, there, there is a, one man who was in one of the camps. His name is Paul van Tucher, a German. He's written a book in English. And I know that there is a young guy at Oxford right now, a student, an Indian student, who is writing his PhD thesis on this. Incredible. But very little is known. And this Tucher, and there's, a, there's, a, there's a, an item on Wikipedia which I, you know, I don't really know any more than anybody else does about the history of all of this because I've never really got involved in it. So but you experienced I, it. I experienced it as a very young child, but but we were there for five and a half years. So by the time I was, I I had my second birthday at this camp. I was because I was not quite two when we left Lahore. And what was the camp like? Um, what were the living conditions, and what do you remember? I remember very little of that. That was the first camp. We were there for, I think, two two years. And the second camp, we were for three and a half years. The so total of, um, actually, it came to about six and a half years altogether. In both wow. Five and a half years, sorry. Um, so my memories are much more of the second camp. But the first one was this, it was up in three or 4,000 feet up in the mountains. And so monsoon was a very big issue for my parents because they had two young children in nappies, in diapers, and they, you know, they, there was no electricity. So I, I, whatever, I'll tell you how, what I know about those camps objectively is from the stuff that my father has written and other people have written. We were basically, an internment camp is considered, is considered a, 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 a legitimate legal way to sequester people that you're not sure about. It's not, there's nothing, the India did nothing illegal, the British did nothing illegal with these camps. 
But they, what they did is they gave, it's, it's the, and money was allotted to each family. So we, I think it was something like 70 rupees a month for a family, whatever, I don't know what the rupee was worth in those days. And then we actually, then the, the family itself could only keep 10 rupees and the rest went to the camp contractor who took care of all the food. So we had our food, I mean, we were not starving. We had, we had, we were lived in barracks. And these barracks were converted into sort of family units. So we each had, each family had like two rooms and a bathroom of some kind. But again, there was no electricity. So it was, I think the best way to describe the, the camp from things that, I mean, because I don't remember that much of, I have isolated memories, but I think it was, obviously it was not a concentration camp. The objective was not death. The objective was not to kill people. The objective was to sequester them. And so instead of, it wasn't an existential problem living as these young, because most of them, many, many young people in the middle of their careers, the big problem they had was psychological because they didn't know what the future held. They didn't know how long they would be there. They did in many cases, the Jews, because very few of these people were Jews. Um, most of them were Germans who were either missionaries doing Christian business, you know, um, I forget the word for that, or they were business people, like big German paint companies, those things, they, they were there. And so they were all arrested as aliens, as enemy aliens, wow. because Britain was at war with Germany. And did you get like your own private home there? Was it like a little village or was it like a big fortress? What was it? They, they, they were barracks that were converted and I th I have a memory of a house. Now I'm, just, you know, I wish my parents were alive because I never really, I always assumed you had this house. I remember that there was um, a papaya tree, a papaya tree and a gooseberry bush and an outhouse for the bathroom. So I think that's what, but mostly it's written that there were barracks that were converted. Now my father was a doctor and he was a medical, made a medical, officer at one stage. So maybe we were upgraded to an actual house. I don't know. My brother also remembers a house. So your father practiced medicine in the internment? Well, he didn't practice it. He was, he practiced on behalf of the camp. It wasn't private right. practice. Right. So somehow or other, and I don't know how, he had as maybe word spread, but things like the Maharani of Kuch Bihar and the Maharani of Baroda, they were his patients. So there was, he was allowed to leave the camp to go and give medical consultation to these Maharanis. And he, I mean, I have letters, uh, incredible letters from them. They're very flowery handwriting. And, and, and he, I have one of my memories is I was about six and he took me with him to Bombay or to, to Kuch Bihar, I don't know wherever we went um, to see the queen the Maharani. So I remember that. That and is, what a unique memory. Yeah. And it was a little bit traumatic. I write about, because I'm writing a book, as I think I've, I've told you. I'm writing a book, and that is a story in the book. And so it was traumatic to meet the Maharani, or traumatic? Uh... It was for my tra my father. Well, he went there, and he, he had, I was all excited. He's going to see the queen. You're going to see the queen. and And then... Finally, we get to see, and you know, I had my best dress on, and he, had, my mother, taught him how to do my hair in ringlets, you know, wrap around it, with like curly hair, and um, and so it was all prep. And then he said, "Now, see, here's the queen. I've taught you how to curtsy, curtsy to see the queen." And I, I, start, I said, "I want to see where's the queen? Where's the queen? That's not a queen." Oh. Because she was in mourning, she was wearing a white sari. She was, and I said, "That's not a queen. That's an ayah." Oh, so my she gosh. was not happy. So it's traumatic. So she got angry, and so her daughters quickly took me away, and gave me what I remember from that is that I had chocolate pudding. They gave me chocolate pudding shaped like a rabbit. That's what I remember of that day. But for him, it was a little bit embarrassing. It felt traumatic, but embarrassing. Mm -hmm. Right. She would. She did not take kindly to my. I can imagine. Aya. 
I can imagine. <laughs> uh, it be, you know, uh, childhood innocence. Sometimes yes. the innocent mistakes we make as, as children. And, and not only childhood innocence. He was, I mean, he had only been in the country for three or four years. He didn't know all the ins and outs of, you know. Right. He didn't know all the cultural norms and how to interact in a situation like that. So that's that was you know, and then so then we were we was we stayed in this this sec the second camp. These were actually, it's it's very unclear to anybody who's that a little bit that I read about that have this has been written. They were f considered family camps, but a lot of people didn't have families. And at, the, at one stage, the men and the women were separated. See, they came the people. There were the people came to these camps from all over. There, were, there was a big central camp in Dehradun. And then after that, they were sent to these other places. I think there was not a very clear plan at all for any of this. So they came and they, like we were, we came, we were, we shouldn't have ever gone to it because we were not enemy aliens. But they didn't know what to do with us. And the, the other thing is that among the people, the majority of the people who were German, were among the people who were not Jews rather, they were they were designated uh, uh, characterized as either Nazis, anti-Nazis, or fascists. Because they're a lot of Italians. And what about you guys? What was we your? Were, we were with the with the anti-Nazis, the non-Nazis. Mm, interesting. But but German was the language, and so we, my brother and I, went our first learn, education was was in German, and it was. So the other part of the camp with all these people were, they were many, as I say, in the middle of their careers and so on, and they were just, you know, interrupted. And they, they were, they, their lives were not in danger. Yeah. Their psychology was very depressed. They tried right. to have concerts and they tried to have plays and they tried to have discussion groups and they tried to do all kinds of things. But in the end, they gave into depression and hopelessness. Because a, they didn't. A lot of them didn't know why they were there. They didn't know how long they would be there, and also, there there was the Jew Nazi. There's a division between Jews and Nazi and anti Nazis. They were not getting proper. Imagine the the, the whole the, the 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 news coming from Europe was very unclear. It was censored. They were not getting straight news from any reliable source. You know, there was either propaganda or it was underground information. So they didn't really know what was happening. And they didn't know that anybody really even knew where they were. So that was the kind of thing that really got to them. There apparently were no suicides, though my father himself said he was very close to suicide himself. Wow. Um, but because it was just so hopeless and you didn't know why or for how long. And, and you didn't really understand the rules and then the commandant, the head of the thing, of the camps would change and a new one would come in and 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 there was just a lot of bitterness between this these these the Nazis, the anti Nazis, the fascists, all these things. And this just this feeling of you know, so I think people withdrew a lot and they kept to right. themselves. Were there a lot of children there? And did you get to go to school? Yeah, yeah. We went to this, this German German school. I mean I know all of these German nursery rhymes. You know, cause, I mean, I don't even know what language my parents spoke to us because they didn't speak English. They 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 were German or Polish, whatever. They never spoke Polish. My father never spoke Polish, but they spoke German and they learned English in order to come to India. And they they had they had a my mother had a munshi who taught her English. My father had gone to someone to teach him. So I don't know what language they even talked to us in, um, but we learn German in some, you know, I, so I don't know. I, 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 those things are just a bit unclear. My, or my father has written an enormous amount about all of this. He's documented all of this in English, mostly in English, thousands and thousands of pages. And, and is that this, something you're planning to publish? It's, it's all actually archived in the Leo Beck Institute, B-A-E-C-K Institute in Manhattan. With, right. off, with with centers in Jerusalem and Berlin, Mirror Institutes. So 
So they took a lot of the work. I have a lot of the originals, but I gave them to them, and they digitized first. They they digitized it all. This they um. Well, it's it's in digital form. So there are. It's just called the Herman Selzer Collection, or Herman something like that. That's my father's name. So all of that is available, and and that's how, for instance, this this young student at Oxford got in touch with me through that. And I've had through the years I've had people contact me because they've gone to do research there. It's called the Center for German Jewry, I think. German Jewry. J E W Y. And this is based in New York, if I recall. On 16th Street. Uh, yeah, 16th Street. Where's 16th Street? Yeah. And the material is available online? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can send For you. our viewers. Yeah. Yeah. I'd, so people have definitely over the years gone there. It's had a lot of views and all that stuff. So, but, um, and, what, and at what point did this all come to an end? I can't it, imagine living years and years without knowing when a situation like this is going to end. You guys were there for five years. That's just five, incredible. Yeah, five and a half years. And the the wards we were there from December 9th or something like that, nineteen forty, till May, August. Sorry, I've got I always bad these dates. Some, no, August 1946. So, um, five and a half years, yeah. So, then the war had already ended, but we were not released. So a lot of, see, the Germans, the, the problem was that when the camps were dis dismantled, the thing would be that people would be repatriated to their original countries, which would have been Poland or Germany. And, you know, Jews were not willing to go back to to Germany or Poland, so a lot of the Germans were sent back, and then then they were rehabil rehabilitated. You know, I forget that's not the right word, not rehabilitated, but they were re whatever in in Germany to get rid of their Nazi kind of affiliation. I forget the name of what the word is, but they um so in for so my father they kept saying, well, if you have a visa, you can leave. But they were not. They couldn't just release people to, into the into the. Well, they probably could have. So my father had all these years. He'd been writing to all the governments of the world. I'm a doctor. I can come and be your medical this, your medical that. Even to Afghanistan, believe it or not, he wrote. Wow. <laughs> to America and to this country and and to the, the Maharani's and all these other things. So, um, so in the end, we were released into the care of the Jewish agency, the Jewish, uh, J -R, I think Jewish refugee agency in Bombay. We were released into their care. And they were, we were there for three months in some kind of place that they put together where there were other people till we had a place to go. And Begum Shanavaz, who is an important, from an important political party in Lahore, who had been, who my parents had known before in turn. Right. She said, you must come back. I will make arrangements. I'll get you a house. I'll get you all this. So in 1946, in August 1946, we went back to the hall. It's fascinating. That's incredible. So what was that like? How did you guys, where did all your stuff go? Uh, where did you? A lot of it had been kept, they, you know, they had allowed my father to go back to Lahore pack up everything from the camp. So I don't know what year that was. So a lot of stuff was in storage. Yeah, I mean, they had friends, they had patients, people knew them. They'd already started this medical practice. Right. And there were Hindus and there were Muslims. There were no Jews really, but, um, and there were Brits there. So they, they were a, it's a, it's a collection of people. But I think the, the real thing, we just wanted to start a medical practice again. Right. So it was took a long. It was very painstaking. It was accommodation, you know, they brought this beautiful, all this beautiful furniture from Rome. It was Art Deco stuff because that's what their, their, that was their their generation was Art Deco, you know, furniture. And so they a lot of it. They had to sell. They, I have records of all the pages and pages and pages of all the things that were sold, they forcibly sold. But they wow. Them and they're really, it's a thick thing of in that 
particular kind of handwriting in handwriting. Immaculate record keeping. And this is, it was sold before you went to the internment camp. Yeah, or during, as I say, my father was able to go back because we had to leave in three, they give us three days. After coming wow. to work, they said three days. He said, how can I leave like this? Are you gonna be responsible for everything? So they are three days, so on the, uh, on the December the, December the 9th or 8th or 9th, um, 1940s when we went to the camp. So that was far, yeah, that, that's right, the dates are now, now right, correct. Wow, the so, 1940s really were such a tumultuous time for, you know, so many groups of people all over the world. Yeah, and especially, you know, they left Germany, they left Italy, then they come to India, British India, they set up a medical practice, and then they have to cancel that all again and start again, right. go to the camps, then start again, you know, it's that. And um, my father said, and I, I quote him in my book, he said that he, it was always on the, on the it was called the Royal Mail the train, and he, that he hoped that the train would never arrive because he just couldn't yet again get off the train and, and at a railway station and start again, you know. So it was very difficult, but they were, in the end, they were very successful and they were tremendously welcomed and um, encouraged and supported by by the whoever was living in Lahore, you know, whether it was Muslims or Hindus or Christians or any British or whatever, you know, because they were they were doctors. Right. I mean, I think that was a lot of it was they had something to offer, and there weren't that many. There weren't any other Europe. They were Christian doctors, American Christians, doctors, um, hot, hot, uh, hospital, but they had they were particular kind of. It was a particular kind of practice, and they were known as German doctors. Very interesting. You know, um, what's really fascinating, I'm just going to throw this in here. My uh, grandfather, great-grandfather, and for many generations, they were doctors in Lahore as well. And in my family history, they do talk about German medicine. They, uh, I mean, I was very young when my grandfather passed away. He was, um, I was five years old, so I never, you know, got a chance to probe him. But I know that we have, um, you know, there's Yunani medicine and so on. You hear about these different forms of medicine that were being practiced in Lahore. Lahore was supposed to be a city of doctors mm. where um, a lot of royalty apparently from the Middle East would also come to, you know, get cured. And so you had doctors practicing all kinds of different varieties of medicine. It's, it's so fascinating to me. So do you remember where, um, your family lived in Lahore at all? Do you remember the neighborhood at that time? You mean in in the in the fifties? In when you returned in the nineteen forties, um, and we what one said was in Canal Bank. Okay. Then we were on. I, I have it listed: Davis Road, um, Edgerton Road, things like that. But in the end, we it was fifty five Lawrence Road. That's. When we came back in nine, I think it was about nineteen forty-eight. So we come back in forty-six, six. Right. But the, we actually didn't move into the house. I think till forty-eight. Begum Shanavas arranged this house for us. And where and were you staying in the interim from nineteen forty-six? This house, that house. Okay. You know, they were. I think he had. He was able to get a place for his practice, but it was all very subpar. And one, it was actually a Hindu, I don't know who it was, but one of the people he also has corresponds with was Kushwant Singh, the writer. Oh, interesting. Uh, letters from him. Um, the people were trying to say, you can't live like this. You've got to get a better place. This is shocking, this is shameful. They were embarrassed for him. So your father uh, mm -hmm. communicated with Kushwant Singh, the writer, even after partition. I think so. I have to. I have to find it. I mean, I came across it the other day. Those would be very historic letters. I think you really? should find I, yeah. them. Yes. <laughs> and, and also, and do do you know who? I mean, you. I know you're not Muslim, but it's very important to Muslims is Muhammad Assad. Yes, I've heard that name, of course. And he wrote the the the, uh, the definitive book on the prophet or Islam or something. He was in the camp as well. 
I have a picture in my father. My father has a picture in one of these huge books that he did. He kept everything. And these are the things that have been, you know, digitized and so on. There's a picture and it said, and then it was called, because Muhammad Assad, he was German or Viennese. He's also, I think he's from Vienna. Or I'm not sure. And he was known as Muhammad Assad Weiss till he then became Muhammad Assad. So there's a picture of him in front of our house in Edgerton Road or wherever it was. And this is Muhammad Assad Weiss. And why was he in the camp? Because he was a Jew. German, maybe he was German, maybe he was Austrian. Not everybody stayed for a long time. A lot of people were released. And that's what my, was particularly galling for my parents is this, like, why have we been arrested? And why haven't we been released? And he, he, the last thing my father said, I don't never understand why we were there and why we were not there. And were you hearing news mm -hmm. at this point, at any point mm -hmm. uh, of what was happening in Germany? Well, but it was always very, um, it was either propaganda. Nobody knew where, where, how to trust the news. So the Nazis would sometimes burst into song because they'd heard that the Nazis had had some new victory somewhere. Till Stalingrad, then, they, every, then everybody realized that this is real news and it's over for the Germans. The Russians have won, whatever. But that was part of the pressure in this camp where these different place the different ideologies and so on that they'd come from. And you couldn't trust the news that I was saying before. Either the news came from some underground sources, you know, which they would be blogs or sort of intercept or something like that, those kind of things. Or they came from propaganda or from British news. I mean, just it was people, it was part of the uncertainty was not being able to trust, trust news sources. Oh, and, it, oh, and it also came very late, very sort of three months old by the time you got it, you know. Right. And so I want to now switch gears a little bit and try to understand what the atmosphere was like in 1946 in Lahore, from what you can remember. And how old were you at that time? I was, I was born, so I, in 1946, I was seven. Okay. And what was the atmosphere like? Do you remember at all? Not really. I just remember going to sporting to to uh, convents. I mean, we we lived as I said, I don't even really remember very well that house that we lived in. I remember going to school to to Jesus and Mary convent of Jesus and Mary with my ayah and my brother, and you know, I think we were. I think we. I think the atmosphere in Lahore. I, I would have difficulty in separating from the atmosphere that surrounded my family. Because after all this depression and anxiety and all this stuff, we were traumatized. We were suffering from trauma when we came to Lahore. Not so much my brother and me, but my parents. Because they didn't know what was going to happen. And so they didn't know who their friends were going to be. Because, you know, they had been rejected as Germans, and then they'd been rejected because they were interned, so you didn't want to deal with people like my parents, you know. So somehow um, they found their way. What the atmosphere, all I remember from was that we came, we, we hadn't, my brother and I hadn't even seen electricity till we left the camp. There wow. Was no so there was no electricity at the camps? No, we had kerosene. Before. And how did you watch movies? And We didn't watch movies. Oh, okay. I thought for some reason you had theater, but I guess a different kind of well, theater. People putting on a show, just right. you know, drama people, or reading a poem, or having a debate, or something. No, there was no, no, no. This we what we did have, and my and again, I write about this in my book was that um, on Thursdays, my parents initiated. They had gramophones and they had, you know, records, LPs, vinyl, and so they. There were three other people, and they always would gather on Thursdays at my parents' house, and they'd have coffee and cake and stuff like that, and they'd listen to music. And because it was such a drag to be listening to classical music and then keep turning the record over for the next or to the next 
putting another record in, they were, they were able to get two gramophones. So that when one was playing, then they were, could, the second one could already be before the other one was finished. So that was the kind of thing that they occupied them. And the, I have one of the things I have as a as a an artifact and as a object of my of that time was a cigarette box that somebody had carved, and the names of the people who came on Thursday. It was called Donnerstag, which is German for Thursday. So that was the kind of. And my father wrote a, a novel, and my mother. And then later on, they also tried to put together a medical tropical diseases medical book which was published but not then somebody else published a new thing better thing so nothing ever came but i have all those things and i write about those in my the 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 legacy you know of the but he's my father said that the only way he's remained sane was by writing did your father ever publish the novel that you're speaking in about german. it's in german i tried once to get it published and they at that stage the german publishing industry said they were not interested. They only wanted to have um, document documenting real stuff, bio bi biography. They didn't want novels. I think you might consider self-publishing it now. I, I would like to, but I I mean I I actually am planning to. That's find fantastic. Out. I know a few more people now than I did then um, when I first tried this, um, but it would have to. And he um, he wrote it in German. And my own German wasn't really good enough to translate it or even to understand it properly. So he translated it into English for me. And then I I then translated into Hakka English. Because my father's <laughs> English was a little bit like a little bit flamboyant, a little Germanic. It was all, you know, grammatically perfect, but it was so I sort of modernized it and he got really angry with it about that. Mm -hmm. Some loss in translation, an emphasis, so, perhaps. So the, the, if it, I, I think it's a really good story. I think it should be, you know, and if I have the energy, I might pursue it. Well, I'll encourage you to um, put in the energy to get it out there, okay. if possible. Perhaps we can translate and, into Hindi and Urdu first. <laughs> and I have another, um, I wanted to check in now on 1947. Do you have memories of what happened in 47 in Lahore? I know you were quite young then. Yeah, but so in 46, as I say, we were just traumatized. And there's photographs of us as a family looking just miserable. I mean, it's a proper official photograph, but everybody, there's just, it was, you, you have to see the picture. It's in my book. I can't in wait. Seven, in 47, we then went to, we went to school, to con these convents and stuff. I went to about three different convents in all. But in 47, we went to Kashmir, as they had done in 1940. Like everybody went, because it's too hot in the hall, so you went to mm -hmm. Kashmir, synagogue to go to have a practice there. So they took the practice to Nidu's Hotel in Srinagar. And, and I remember that very well. And, and then we were not allowed. So my mother was very anxious. So we were going to go for the summer to across the to, to another convent. Because we were there for several months. It wasn't just like two months. It'd be from May to October, maybe, or September, I don't know. So and they, my parents were all they cared about was education, education for them. Their children should be educated. So they sent us across the Dal Lake on this shikara to this convent. And then my mother started getting really neurotic and she said, it's too dangerous, it's too dangerous, it could, you could drown and all this stuff. So they took us out of that place and sent us to this little English school called the Garden School in Gurumar, mm -hmm. on the mountains. So we were there for eight weeks. I know because I wrote eight letters home every week. We were, it's a boarding school. Huh. Do you still have those letters? Yeah, oh, it's all I have everything, and it's amazing. It's all in again in my book, but my mother kept everything. She kept all the every single letter we ever That's wrote. Fantastic. And 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 my father did his documenting of just recording his memories of it all, 
and had a lot of documentation for everything. So uh, my family is very well documented. That's amazing. And, but still, I still had to write my version of, of my own life. So, so we went with, at, in this garden school, and they would come up every Sunday and take us. Uh, I, I don't even know where we went. There's pictures of other people from Lahore, friend, Pakistani friends who came in some horses up in the mountains there. So dismal, you know. <laughs> you know the, there were terrible, little, terribly weird little photographs. We barely make out anything. But that was all, that was, and then in 40s, so that was in, let's say in. 47, I, I believe. In 47, I'm saying in 47, I'm trying to think how long exactly that was. I think we were supposed to come back to Lahore in September. But then partition happened. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't, they, they couldn't get petrol. We had a car. We had we came we had come by car, but we couldn't go back because there was no petrol. So they had to wait for permission to get by petrol, because the Maharaja had apparently sequestered all the petrol for him and his crew. So, so they, uh, can you repeat that? So the Maharaja. Um, so why was there no petrol? I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, why was there no petrol? Because the Maharaja had apparently taken it. Oh, wow. It was not allowed for distribution. Right. But my father and there were other, I think four other families or three, three I think three other families who wanted to get back to Lahore. Interesting. And the only way we could do that, or they could do that, was to apply for permission to the, to the, I can, I have that written somewhere. Here, here. This is from my father. He said, um, Petrol supplies were exhausted, except for any vehicles belonging to the Maharaja. So on Thursday, the 6th of October, they got permission to leave Kashmir. It was issued by His Highness, the government of Jammu and Kashmir, the Inspector General of Police. And the permission was that four car cars were allowed 12 gallons each and along with one lorry or truck that that carried 65 mounds, mounds of luggage and four servants. So we had permission then to leave Kashmir and, uh, and to cross the customs through Kohala. And that was in October, 6th of October, 1947. So we, we had to wait till that was, and there, there's, doc, there's a document that says all of that somewhere. Wow, oh, that is really fascinating. And so you were finally able to make it back to Lahore by driving yourself. And my father writes of the horror, of horror of, you know, as of, of, of seeing all the, the horror of partition in Lahore. The people everywhere and the deaths and the, and, and as doctors, they had volunteered to do whatever they could as to help. And because they somebody had put out a, a medical community, put out a, a call for doctors. And then they didn't hear back. And he said, why can't, why haven't you called us? We've offered. And, it's like, I don't know. and then he was also part of the Rotary Club, my father. He, was, he became president of the Rotary Club at some stage. I don't know if it was then already, but they you know, got involved with creating food and being, you know, just, Giving people food to all these and what people. do you, what was the journey like back from uh, Srinagar to Lahore? I don't remember it honestly. I don't remember it. Um, and then as soon as we got back, we'd already missed school, so we were going to yet another convent, you know. Um, and so then that's that's what I I'm not. You know, my father. I, I that's what I remember. I just remember. For me, life was around school and our dog. We had a dog. I write more about my dog. Wrote, thought, I didn't have a diary then. I started a diary later on. But but even the, these eight letters that I wrote to my parents from this garden school, it's always more because the dog, our dog was called Jumbo. Bring Jumbo. Please make sure Jumbo comes. You know, bring, bring me new pencils. It was that kind of thing. Um, what kind of dog was it? What kind of dog was Jumbo? Yeah. 
copper spaniel with a white chest. <laughs> and he figures very largely in my letters home for, for years, and my brothers, I think. And so, um, you know, so then, then we just, I, we didn't really have friends because we 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 just been in the camps and then we came from the camps you know and then i mean we just didn't have a normal life we didn't have friends i mean we had one one or two friends and i had one pakistani friend Tala Dhani, and i was friends with her forever and um and she's died unfortunately since but and when my parents my, then i lived in america and when my parents we, we did a surprise party for their 50th wedding anniversary, and Talat and her husband came to that. The most spectacular photograph. That's amazing. I just realized this is my God. So, um, so it was, you know, we it was a life. It, it was just not a normal life. I didn't yeah. know. I mean, I, it took me a long time. It, where I live now, it's so, so predictable. Right. Everybody's lived here forever. Their mothers or their grandparents are all around the corner. Everybody's it's right. a, a lot of, you know, Indian families, even across, even if they go to another continent like America, you still always stay connected. Because you have a country and you have an ancestral home. We didn't have those. Right. Lahore is my beloved birthplace. I have spent my entire life not my entire my adult life trying to get back to Lahore after you left. And so when um how long did you live in Lahore after that, after partition? Oh, till seventy one. Till nineteen seventy one. Okay. Well, that's so that's when my parents left. I had already I mean I had already gone to two more boarding schools. I'd gone to a boarding school in Masuri, I went to Woodstock School. Okay, and when was that? When did you leave for in, Woodstock? I, I went to Woodstock in nineteen fifty. Okay. My brother and I was. They took us up to Woodstock, and we stayed there fifty and fifty one, and then the middle of fifty two, they decided they didn't like the education we were getting from the American missionaries, so they decided we go to England. So they took us out of school, brought us down early, and we went to be tutored by these Capuchin uh, Bel Belgian monks who were in the cathedral or whatever in Lahore. Belgian monks, and they taught us Latin and French because we'd never had Latin and French at Woodstock. Mm -hmm. So they That's taught us that. But it's my brother and me, we had private tuition so we could get into a British school. So then at the age, in 1952, when I was 13, getting on for 14, was the first time I ever left the subcontinent. Wow. And that was to go and see via Israel. They were in, but I'd never seen any of my family and my relatives, they were all in Israel. We never saw them. My parents saw them when they went to Europe in 1950, but at the first time they went back after the war. And so I met them, and then we, we went to the school in England, Bedales, which was a very progressive, non-denominational, so religion was no longer an issue. This was always a very difficult thing to know how to be Jewish, because you, we had, there were no Jews around. It was a very, I mean, you know, it was just the whole thing was very, um, it's always negotiating, having to negotiate. Your identity, right. Yeah. You were always negotiating your identity. And uh, what was the name of the school in England again? And where was it that you went? B-E-D-A-L-E-S. -E it's a well-known school. It's a very progressive, as I say. And it's really, um, it's well-known now for, for arts, for the arts as much as for anything else. And it's a little bit, uh, so trendy and a lot of rich people send us kids there. But my parents, I mean, I, I don't even know how they made decisions. It's not they were stupid people, they were educated people, they were doctors, but they didn't, they didn't how do you choose an English boarding school if you're a German Jew from, you know, wherever? And you've been, it's just they didn't have, they, they were smart and they made good decisions, but they also made bad decisions. and. But it was a good decision. That was a good He sent us to that school. It was very good. And then did you go back to visit your parents? Well, my parents then, yeah, I always visited my parents. Yeah. I mean, I always went. And they, and they when we were in school, they would come too. My mother would come for the summer. We always went to Lahore for the holidays. Mm -hmm. Not so much for the summer, 
because it was too hot. And then one summer we went to Natya Gali or Murray or somewhere like that up in, in those mountains. But usually they, my mother would come and take us around Europe. She wanted us to be educated, civilized in the European stuff because we were getting these other things, you know, right. just so they were trying to balance those things. And the Jewish thing basically was fell by the wayside in the end. I mean, I, I've rejected all of that, but, um, but it was very difficult to be Jewish when, because it, one of the essences of a Jewish practice is you have to have 10 people for prayers. And we never, never 10 people. So we never had anything, you know, we, it was all like bits and pieces. Right. And, and but I tried that as well. I mean, tried all of that. So it was again, part of the negotiation. And so since we're running out of time, I know your full oral, oral history interview is going to be in the archive, so people will be able to watch that. Uh, but what I wanted to touch upon was, um, so where did you end up going to college? And then I'm going to ask you one more question after that. I went and how to you in the United States after that? Yeah, I went, to, I went to University College London, so University of you know, UCL, okay. for my BA. And then I went to the Australian National University where I did a PhD in psych. I did psychology in London and then psychology PhD in Canberra, Australia. And how did you end up choosing psychology? Well, my parents, I think they, ne they never put pressure on us to be any particular, you know, career. But they sort of hoped that maybe we'd be, my brother and I would become medical doctors. But I was really pathetic when it came to all the sciences. I just was not, I couldn't absorb science studies. So I, I said, I'll try, but I, they, they said, you don't have to. And when I went to, to BDELS, I, I mean, I, I only just read my chemistry or something. You have to know science if you're going to be a physician. And so I just thought, I just psychology, I mean, I, was reading Freud and stuff like that and just appealed to me. But it was, you know, but I didn't really think of careers. I don't think we thought about careers when we went to university the way students, kids do now. It was just not career oriented. It's like, what, what interests you? Right. And so that's what I did. And, you know, somehow I got a PhD. And what interested you me. in psychology? I just was always curious, trying to make understand people understand I yeah. came out of just always trying to figure out in order to negotiate as i had to do everything you have to know what the other person on the other side of the negotiation is i think and i, I as i read my letters and and my diary that i kept from the age of 14 always trying to understand why do people behave this way because everything was so mysterious because it was always new and different and strange He's going to these schools, they were so different from each other. And one minute I'm negotiating, you know, Jesus and God and stuff. And the next it's, you know, the Vietnam War. I mean, whatever it was, it was always trying to understand who these people are that I'm supposed to be friends with or who my cousins are. You know, I never knew what cousins were because I hadn't had any. So how are you supposed to act towards a cousin if you've never met one? I mean, it's probably very strange to you because you were should come from a very closely knit long line of families, you know, but I did not. And so I think that it's, and I, to this day, the only regret I've ever had is that I didn't actually go in for clinical psychology and become a practicing mm -hmm. psychologist as opposed to an experimental one, or, but it's still embedded in me in some way, you know, but. And my final thought for you is, um, you know, from all of these experiences of the 1940s that you've had and then what you witnessed um, during partition and all of that, what is your thought for, you know, the future generations and our future as humanity? Advice, thoughts? Good. Honestly, honestly, it's just, I, I'm very perturbed, very, I, I talk to my grand, I have two grandchildren, one is 15 and one is 27. Honestly, I just wish I could talk to them more because they're not thinking about these things. And I just think, I mean, one of my things to them is just be kind. Please be kind. Be more, however kind you are, 
be more kind. You know, I think that be kind and be kind to our planet. I mean, I'm looking at these trees up so I mean, be kind to these trees. You know, that, that in this, the anger, there's so much anger and hatred right now that that's, I don't know where it's going to go. And it, and we need equity. We need people to be less different, less, they need more balance. And to the extent that anybody in their daily life can create more balance and less difference among people. That's the only hope. Otherwise, we, we, otherwise we will live in a permanent state of war because we will always think of everybody else as our enemies if they're not exactly like us. So, um, I mean, my children, my grandchildren are very nice people. I mean, they are kind and they do care about these things. But I want them to be leaders more. I want them to take leadership, not elected leaders, but among their communities. Spread, spread those ideas around of yeah. meeting everybody. And, and have conversations. You know, I believe really deeply in conversations. So that's, I always encourage people to have conversations. I think it, it can't do any harm. But, um, can sometimes do some good. Fantastic message. Um, well, hopefully our audience members will heed that as well. Uh, thank you so much, Hazel, for taking I the time. I love your work. You know, I really am such a fan of your work. And I owe you some things, I think. I owe you some writing, which I've done. Yeah. We can talk about that maybe. Yeah, definitely. I'll reach out to you about that offline. Um, and I can't wait for the full oral history interview with you as well. Um, yeah. So just it's so amazing. illuminating. And I think you've opened up a whole new chapter of understanding. You've peeled back the onion some more for really? um, South Asians, especially and even British history, because this, you know, this part about Germans or uh, anyone associated with Germany, I, I know you were, you had a Polish passport, your parents did, um, to be interned. I don't think people really know about that history too much, or even that Jews fled to British India. I should put this, you in touch with this, this young man in, at Oxford who's doing this. That'd be fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Talk to you yeah, thank you so much for joining us. And for our viewers, uh, you know, thank you for joining us for the 48th day. Day 49 is tomorrow, same time every day. Um, I'm co-hosting this series with Aprajita Dagger, with Sonam Kalra, and we will have a guest appearance at some point by Noor Chava, our former host for uh, Sunday Stories. Um, so please join us daily. And thank you so much again, Hazel. It was so good to talk to you today. My pleasure. I'm so glad to be connected to you. <laughs>